welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Virginia McKenna, co-founder of the Born Free Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> no, so, so who would have thought that 35 years ago, your, this little idea that you had with your husband and your son, Will, would grow into the vision that it's become today? Wow. Well, I, I certainly don't think we ever thought it would. Um, as some people might know, we started because of the zoo issue, wild animals in captivity, because of the death of an elephant, a teenage elephant that we'd worked with in a film. That's quite a long story, so I won't tell this minute. But um, it, then, it then grew into something much bigger than we ever imagined. We yeah. thought we would stay with captivity, but it then went on to animals in the wild as well. Quite a movement. Um, mm-hmm. So did you ever think that animal welfare, because obviously originally you were an actress, mm-hmm. um, did you ever, was animal welfare kind of ever in your periphery as a career or anything? Well, animals have always played a huge part in my life. When I was a child, my father had all sorts of animals that I would deeply disapprove of now. He had a snake called George, and he had budgerigars in a cage, which actually I accidentally let out one day to clean the cage, and they flew out of the window. So it wasn't a very happy result for myself, and I was a bit punished for that. But also, I'm not sure how long a life a captive budgie would have had in the wild, but that was a terrible accident. But, and he had two bush babies, and so I did have a lot of wild creatures in my young life. Wow, so was that in the UK he had bush yes, babies? It, yes, in ha- we had a house in, he had a house in Hampstead. Oh, wow. And then we moved to Horsham, actually, in Sussex. Oh, my gosh, so <laughs> Sussex really is mm. really does have a place in your heart. I, yes. I hadn't realised that. And mm. um, why bush babies? I mean, where had he found those from? I don't know. It's very strange. I, I, I was a bit small then, and I didn't really ask questions like that. Um, I did know that he was very interested in re- in snakes because, um, apart from dear George, who slithered around the garden f- from time to time, um, because he used to be very friendly with the keeper of this reptile house at London Zoo. And when I was very small, like five or six years mm. old, I would be taken with him to have the snakes. And I used to have them put around my neck and I was completely happy with it. So I never had this innate fear of snakes, which a lot of people do. And I'm very grateful for that, actually, although... I, wouldn't approve of another George being in a cage. No, what a juxtaposition <laughs> yes. sort of from your childhood mm. to what you've ended up making a life out of. Yes. And um, that's so interesting. Um, and I wonder, how do you sort of try to bring nature into your, as a poet, like apart from your work, I suppose, how do you try and bring nature on that one-to-one level into your life nowadays? I suppose the only answer I can give to that would be that um, <clears throat> my husband Bill and I, we lived in London when we first were together, and uh, we never wanted to live in a city. And so we started looking for somewhere in the country, and we spent about two years looking for something, and one day we came across uh, the place where I live still, Mm -hmm. and um, it was a little gamekeeper's cottage with no bathroom, a view to absolutely die for, and he said, we both said, this is it, this is, it's the view. That you could look into the far hills and to the downs beyond, and it's like not being in Africa, but you're seeing the wild, which yeah. was just wonderful. And do you remember the first time that you went to Africa? Because obviously you were you were taken out, weren't you, for the film Born Free, and that's sort of where everything really started. But had you ever been before? Well, I'd been to South Africa <clears throat> because when I was nine, I was evacuated with my mother to South Africa for the war. We went out by ship in 1940. Mm-hmm and came back in 46, so I was there six years, and I went to school in the suburb of Cape Town. Oh, wow. And I went to a convent in Pretoria when my mother worked in in Johannesburg. My mother was the most wonderful jazz pianist, and she was working in the cocktail bar of a hotel, and so I went then up to Pretoria to go to boarding school to be near her, and then she came back again, and I came back again. And um, a friend I had at the school in, in near Cape Town invited me one weekend if I would like to go with her and her family to the Kruger National Park. And I said, oh, I'd love to. So I went. And that is where I saw my first lands, two lands sitting under a tree. I see them to this day. Really? How old are you at the time? I must have been nearly 10. 
Wow. Mm. And that's sort of stuck in, stuck in your oh, mind? Always. The contrast between my visits to the zoo, where I saw lions in the cages at London Zoo, and in those days there was no outdoor area. There was only the indoor concrete pen and them pacing up and down and up and down and the harsh clang of that metal door as you shut it after you'd gone in. That contrasted with the image of the two I'd seen in South Africa. I've never forgotten that. Mm. And, and and obviously um, the anti-zoo zoo sort of movement is something that Born Free still heavily campaigns for. And I know that um, actually just this week, um, was, wasn't it announced um, that the last travelling circuses in England um, are closing up shop. So, I mean, that must be such significance for you and obviously something that you were campaigning for back in the 60s. Is that right? Well, we, I've certainly always been against wild animals in circuses and uh, born f- zoo check, born free. Uh, we've always campaigned again that. It's taken a very, very long time. I remember writing to the then Prime Minister in uh, 2009 about this issue and at last... All these years later, it's happened. I'm overjoyed, absolutely overjoyed. And when you first started cam- campaigning right at the very beginning, how was that? Um, how were you kind of treated by the public? Because you must have been one of the first organisations to sort of to really start that that movement. And how how were you treated? What was the kind of backlash? Well, some of the public were really supportive, and uh, you know they'd got someone who well, Bill and myself and and then uh, Will, our son Will. You know, oh, people with a voice, they're having a voice heard. Of course, the, the, the captivity people loathed us. And I can understand that because we were really uh, having a, a view opposing to the, uh, theirs and saying we don't think wild animals or any animals should be kept in, in captivity. And um, so we made our voice known. It was the death of an elephant at London Zoo that started our work. And that was Poli Poli, wasn't Poli it? Poli. And you worked with her in a film also in Kenya. That's right. It was a film that Bill made with the director of Born Free, James Hill. And it was called An Elephant Called Slowly. And we made it in 68 in Savo. Um, and at that time, the famous couple, Daphne and David Sheldrick, were in Savo. He was the senior game warden. And they were absolutely wonderful. And they had two juvenile elephants that they were, they'd were they rescued and were going to go back to the wild. And when we finished making the film with this little elephant, two-year-old elephant, um, I have to go back a little bit because she'd been captured from the wild by the then government of Kenya as a gift to London Zoo. And when we finished filming, we asked if we could buy have her, buy her from them mm. to give to the Sheldricks so it, she could join the little group. And they said, yes, but we'll have to capture another so we said, we can't, we can't allow another family to be torn in bits. So we didn't do that, and she came to the zoo, and it wasn't until we went to see her and saw her, and she remembered us, she remembered our voices. And there's that famous picture, isn't there, yeah. of you and your outstretched hand mm. and um, Poli Poli trunk. The trunk, She's yes, out she to remembered you. us. So I started fighting to, to get her free, and I found a park in South Africa who would love her there, and I found someone to take her who understood elephants, and the zoo refused, but said they would send her to Whipsnade Zoo, their country zoo, where at least she'd have company of her own kind. Unfortunately, the move never happened because she was kept standing so many hours in her travelling crate, and she collapsed. They managed to get her indoors. Uh, there's a terrible photograph of someone in the army with a car jack, jacking her up onto her feet because she couldn't get up on her own. Got her inside and uh, under anaesthetic they said, oh, we can't do anything. She's lost the will to live and they put her down. And it was her death that started Zuchek. That really is such a heartbreaking it story. What it a really waste. is. And even still now, it mm. must mean so much to you. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I wonder, do you think the public's perception of, of wild animals and the way that we keep them in captivity has changed? I mean, I feel like we so we know so much more, particularly about sort of sentient animals like, like elephants mm. and the damage that keeping them in captivity really does. But do you think there has been a change in the way that, you know, we, we still um, keep animals in captivity? Yes, I do. I mean, I can't speak for Europe and the yeah, Far East and that sort of thing because I've been to some zoos in China and, and, and I'm not sure that the culture there is quite as going in that direction as much as we are. But I do think, I mean, there are no elephants at London Zoo anymore. 
you know, I tick a box there. You mm. have to give credit where it's due. There are all sorts of things there which I still don't like, but at least there are no elephants. I do think there's a change in public opinion because, you see, quite apart from groups, and there are more of us now campaigning against captivity, we see these fabulous documentaries on television where you see animals in nature behaving in nature as they should. And so people now got a, got a sort of contrast. Oh, but it didn't look like that when I saw David Attenborough's film. Well, of course not, because one's free and one's not. So um, I think there is a big sea change, and I think it will get more, actually. I'm hoping it will. No, definitely. And I, I suppose people like um, Damien Aspinall, obviously his father started um, Port Limp and Howlitz. Uh, Howlitz. Yeah, that's the one, Howlitz. Um, and now, obviously, he has called for zoos to be phased out in mm. like the next few... Um, I think it's just wonderful. Yeah, really great. And I wonder, is there, do you think there's been a, like a, a significant moment? Do you think there's been a significant change that's really made those those key people sort of see that? see the things that you've been campaigning for for years? I, su I suppose that's true. It may be a question of different things happening over a period of time. After all, we didn't have a zoo. Uh, we weren't sort of putting our back on having a zoo and wanting the animals to be free because we've never had a zoo. But he and his family, as you've just said, have had a zoo for many, many years. And so it's, it's actually turning his back on his his culture of his family. And I admire him tremendously for doing that. It, it's no small thing. And uh, he has been, he is well known for his uh, rehabilitation of gorillas back to the wild and another species, which I'm afraid I can't remember at this very minute, but the gorillas certainly. So, you know, he, he's already made steps in that direction and now he wants to go the whole way and I'm cheering with all my heart. No, absolutely. Mm. It's re really fantastic steps. And I know that education is something that's really important for you. We just touched upon it there and um, you've just actually come back from school this morning, haven't you? Sort of, yes. Are you, out, are you trying to sort of inspire new generations or are you sort of trying to, I guess, like show them the kind of the error of our ways previously? What's your kind of main motivation for going out into schools? really to just open another door for children to look through and experience the alternative way of looking after the other creatures in the world. You know, we wouldn't like to be shut in a, in a zoo or a human equivalent of a zoo, you know, to survive. And why should animals which are sentient and feel pain, happiness, joy, suffer, virtually all the things that human beings feel, why do we think we have the right to actually cage them, imprison them? And there is no other word. They're not free. They're not free. They're captive. And, you know, we've got safari parks where they've got more space, but that's still not freedom. They can't choose when they get up and go out. To, they can't choose when they go to bed. They can't choose what they eat. They can't interact with each other in a way that wild creatures do. And I'm not saying that's all sweetness and joy by any means, but that's how they've evolved to, to live and survive. And who are we to deny them that? We wouldn't like to be denied it. We rail and rant when we're stopped doing stuff that we feel is important to us as individual humans. And I don't see why animals can't be given the respect that we are given mm. and what would you say to I guess kind of proponents of the zoo initiative that would say that actually the most accessible way to inspire children is to take them to I guess a London zoo what would you say to that well, I can't agree with that at all the way to inspire um, children who need inspiring are to watch the incredible wildlife documentary films made by Attenborough and all sorts of other people going into the jungles in the Far East, going into, onto the plains in Africa, concentrating on a particular species and what that species needs for its own survival, its enemies, its friends, the habitat it needs, what happens when there's a drought. All these things, that's real, not only inspiration but education. So when you see the lonely elephant in the zoo or the monkey with a few branches to jump about on. That's not education. I mean, you can see from the way people sometimes tease the animals or chuck bits of stick at them or whatever it is, you don't always see people behaving respectfully when they're watching animals in captivity. I, w I was in a zoo not very long ago, last year, where there was a sea land pool, 
and the huge male seal was swimming stereotypically round and round the same pattern. I watched for about 15 minutes and he was doing the same thing again and again. That's not education. And people go, oh, look, he's swimming and walk on. And that animal's been hurt and really disadvantaged by where he's been forced to live. And you still go and visit lots of zoos in the UK, is that right? As many as I possibly can, yes. And how does that kind of feed into Born Free's campaign work? Do you do you go with a certain um, agenda or are you just going to sort of really still get a grasp of what's happening in the UK? Does it, I guess it must sort of ground you in a way. It's both, really. I go to see what that particular zoo is doing, what enrichment mm -hmm. they're providing for the animals, um, whether it's a big cat, whether it's a primate, whether it's... a elephant, whatever. Um, I go to see how they're dealing with that. One of the zoos I went to recently, there were two rescued elephants in that place. They had no shade. They had no water freely to drink from or to bathe in. It was at like a barren patch. Oh, God. It wasn't even Is very big. Is this in big. the UK? No, it wasn't to give it its due. Mm -hmm. But um, it was... Actually, it was. It was. I won't. I won't yeah. say it. I don't want to go, do it. Just isolate one name. I don't think that would be fair. Um, but it was totally unacceptable, and um, actually cruel. I thought. No, and there are about sixty elephants. I think still in captivity in the UK. Yes. Um, and if we were to phase out zoos, what what would be the next step? I mean, what would happen for all these animals with that kind of uncertain future? Well, I've got two answers to that. The first is that some zoos that have, that are not zoos, but more safari parks or reserves, that have a population that could tolerate and accept another elephant coming in, uh, and it has to be handled very carefully, of course, over time, um, that would be one. But also, at Born Free, we are actually uh, raising funds at the moment for an elephant sanctuary in Europe. And you know where they would have true space, true uh, freedom to p carry a reasonably free life. Not totally, of course not, with uh, proper veterinary care and all the rest of it. Because they're all damaged psychologically or in some way from being in captivity. Um, so that's, I say, you must get on with it quickly, please, before I die. I want to see the first elephant come to that sanctuary in Europe. I, I long for that because it would be in Poli Poli's memory. No, that would be just lovely. I feel like saying it. I've got goosebumps. Yeah, that would be yeah. so lovely. Um, and how often do you manage to get back out to Africa to see animals in the wild? I know that Kenya obviously has such a resonance for you mm. um, and Meru in particular. Um, you went back just before Christmas, is that right? Yes, I went with my son Will. We went before Christmas. We were invited to go to a to the Mara actually um, by uh, an uh, an organisation that um, invites photographers to come, and they have professional photographers there teaching the amateur photographers about taking wildlife films uh, pictures. And we were invited to go and have a morning where we did a pre PowerPoint presentation and talked about Born Free's work and all that sort of thing. So we were very, very fortunate. And then I was um, back earlier in the year for the 20th anniversary of the opening of Elsa's Copy, the, the lodge in Meru National Park. And Meru in particular, that's where Elsa was released. Is that right? That's right. She so was that must released. Have... Oh, and she's buried there. I met a couple... Um, at Elsa's copy at the, at the camp there this time, this last time, who it was their sixth year of coming to Meru just to go to Elsa's grave oh, wow. to remember Elsa. Oh, wow. It was really so touching, I can't tell you. And Meru's quite a special place, isn't it? It's, yes. So it's far north um, it's and far north. It's, it's quite it, remote, is that right? It's quite remote. You have to get in a small plane to go from Nairobi to go, or you can drive, but mm. that takes quite a few hours. Um, you hardly see a car in Meru. There's the, the camp, but then there's this one tented lodge on the hill called Elsa's Copy. And uh, with a swimming pool, you can lie in, and if you're a swimmer, and you can put your chin on the edge of the swimming pool and you look right over the whole park. It's absolutely wonderful. And is it quite dense bushland? It's mixed. Okay. There are, I think it's four, I'm right in saying 14 rivers. Oh, wow. In Meru, 12 or 14, I can't remember the mm -hmm. exact amount. But so you've got wonderful vegetation and trees 
You've got hippos, crocodiles, you've got everything. You've got the elephants, the giraffe. You've got reticulated giraffes there. And uh, you've got every kind of wildlife you could want. And are there any descendants of Elsa's, um, of Elsa's family there still now? Well, I doubt it. In fact, no, because her cubs were actually released into the, in, in Tanzania. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, she. They weren't re- released in Meru, but you know who knows? A boy, girl, and Ugus, the three lands from Born Free film, that were released there. There's no saying that there aren't one or two descendants of theirs. And Born Free still continues Elsa's legacy today there, anyway. Yes. Um, um, what what are, what's the conservation work that continues there now? Well, I think probably the main one is. Um, snaring and um, checking that everything's safe I for the lands that are in Meru. I think there are about, someone told me the other day, about 60 lands yeah. now in Meru, something like that, which is fantastic. So um, they've got to be safe. We don't want any poachers. And how has the landscape um, and the wildlife changed since you first started going to Meru? Hardly at all. That's so lovely. Which is so lovely. Pristine. Yes, you've got, as I say, the rivers, unless there's a huge drought, um, then, you know, everything suffers. But on the whole, um, you've got the rivers, you've got the fabulous wildflowers that come out at certain times of the year. It's one of the most beautiful parks I've ever been in. And, of course, it's not so large that you can't go over it, and it's got all the history. It's got so many stories to tell. Yeah, can you tell us one of your favourite memories from the park? (laughs) <laughs> I've put you on the spot now. You have put me on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, well, I suppose, if I'm honest, of the park would be 1968. You're so good for the dates. Well, it's just that it combined with making the film about Poli Poli in 1968 when we went out, which I talked about earlier. And Bill said, you know, we can't come to Kenya and not see George. So I said, yes. And so we went up to George's pr- very, very simple little camp. I mean, hardly a, hardly a wire around mm. it, really. And um, we saw him and Elsa, uh, girl, sorry, girl who was one of the Lanas playing Elsa was one of the three that he was returning to the wild. And she came, she was in camp and she walked by as we were sitting at the table like I am now, we're having a mug of tea or something. And I was able to just stroke her back as she passed. And then we went out and we saw Ugus, the big male. And I sat, st- st- stood next to George and looked at him and he didn't bother me. He, I didn't bother him. And then we saw Elsa again, I keep calling her Elsa, girl, lying on the ground. And we crouched down next to her and I was able to stroke her because George said it's fine to stroke her now. So did they live um, in the camp with George or were they, they were free flowing, weren't they? They could come and go as they pleased. They just chose to, is that right? Yes, well, they they did come and go. At first, I think he would acclimatise them Mm -hmm. and bring them in at night, you know, so they were safe at night. But then eventually... They probably got a bit fed up with being that night, you know. And once that uh, she mated with her brother, actually, had cubs. Mm-hmm. And um, once they started to be more wild, um, then they were off. Yeah. Um, and what are your hopes? I know that you're planning to go back, aren't you? Um, I think at the end of August for George Adamson Day and um, back to Meru. What are your hopes for the Meru Cora landscape for 2020? I'm always optimistic. Um, of course, that um, event will be in Cora, not in Meru. We'll probably, we will go to, to Meru, mm-hmm. but the event is in Cora. And I did go to George's funeral, which was one of the most moving. I, Bill and I went together, and it was almost unbearable, to be honest with you. Lots of people there talking and mourning him. And, and of course, he's buried there uh, with Terence's brother, who lived with him at the end of his life as well. Terence was a road maker, George's brother, and he made so many of the roads that are now still in Meru, joining Cora and Meru together. So it was Cora he did the roads for, joining up with Meru. And um, Christian the La, no, sorry, not Dirk, Boy, he's buried there. A little cub called Catania, she's buried there. So you, you go out of the camp, into the, into the reserve and just a little bit down the track you come to this little area where the graves are. Oh wow. It's very very touching yeah. and it's absolutely 
I'm, I'm longing to go back and re- remember it all. No, I can imagine. So how can people help? How can people um, find out more about Born Free's work in Mary? Well, th- probably the best and easiest way would be to go on our website and punch in Meru or whatever the expression is, put in Meru, National Park, um, how can I help, or something like that. It'll all come up. If by any chance people aren't very comfortable with going on the website, because some people find it a bit sort of tricky like I do, um, then I don't see why they can't just give a call to the office and say, where can I find something about Meru because I'm interested in helping in some way. No, absolutely, and we'll be able to help out. Yeah, thank you. So finally, um, how do you manage to stay so relentlessly optimistic? You, you, you must never give in, otherwise they've won. You have, to, you have to believe that in the end, good wins. Good will prevail. Fairness to the animals, concern about their well-being, allowing them to be who they are, not who would, we would like them to be. And I, I do believe eventually that people do understand that as much as they wouldn't like to be told what to do every five minutes of the day and night. To have freedom of spirit, freedom of movement if possible, freedom of choice, because an animal in captivity has none. No choice, no freedom. They're not able to do what they'd really like to do. And I want animals to be themselves, not we, what we persuade them or force them to be. We're so arrogant, and I don't like that. No, no, definitely not. Um, and you are described um, as an inspiration by many people, myself included. <laughs> um, I know, I can see your face. Um, and I wondered who or what inspired you, maybe right at the very beginning of your life. Right at the very beginning of my life, perhaps not, but of my, of of making the film. And of course, Bill was a great, my husband was a great inspiration to me. He was so strong and unafraid to be unpopular, as I'm not. I don't care about being popular. I think it's you follow your heart. And I don't wish ill or evil to anybody or any creature. But I, I just think, I just want, I hope more eyes will be opened the more our stories are told so that more people think, yes, that animal shouldn't be in a zoo cage or being bartered or sold, you know, as a tiny cheetah cub so it can be taken for a ride in a car in the Middle East by some rich person. That's not right. We have to treat animals with the respect that we would like for ourselves. Thank you very much, Virginia. Just one last question. Um, There are lots of organisations that work towards the protection of animals, Mm. wild animals. And um, I wondered, what is it for you that makes Born Free so different? Well, I suppose it's why we began so many years ago. We, We in our turn were inspired. It wasn't our idea. The idea came to us through the experiences we had because of making Born Free, Poli Poli in the zoo and her death, all these things, you either walk away from it or you cannot walk away from it. And we could not walk away from it. And it was the animals. It's always the animals that do it. Just have to open your ears, your heart and your eyes. Thank you very much, Virginia. That's a very inspiring note to finish on, I feel. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media, or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke, and our producer's Philip Fortuna. See you next time.